Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 16th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We look into the numbers behind the latest AKLNG proposal and explain why they raise more questions than they answer. Second, we discuss the arguments the big government Republicans are using in their attempt to maintain control over who benefits from and who pays the bill for government spending. And third, we discuss the ongoing Orwellianization of Alaska language by now changing the words used to describe the PFD to camouflage the inability to change the statute. And now let's join Michael. So let's dive into the weekly top three, Brad, and start off with the big news of the day, which of course is this uh, latest report from Wood McKenzie. Gas is going to save us from the North Slope, but of course, no question. I mean, where does the money come from? That's always the big question. Let's start there. Well, Michael, there it is the big news of the day. The, the uh, Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation last week announced uh, a new study from, from uh, Wood Mac, uh, Wood McKenzie, that, that uh, purportedly shows that uh, gas down from the North Slope, even if just to uh, compete, with, compete in Cook Inlet, you know, just to make deliveries in Fairbanks and deliveries in the Cook Inlet, even if it's limited to that, uh, can nevertheless compete with imported LNG. And if true, uh, and there weren't any, you know, contingencies and if, ands, or buts to it, that'd be, that'd be great news. I mean, it'd be, it'd be news that we could, that we could rely on our own supplies, uh, Alaska supplies, albeit delivered through a long pipeline, but, but, uh, rely on our, on our own supplies to meet Cook Inlet needs. But there are a lot <laughs> of if, ands, and buts. Uh, uh, in this report and, uh, and about the, uh, about the proposal generally. And before anybody leaps off a bridge relying on, uh, relying on this report or relying on this proposal, uh, we need to spend a lot of time analyzing the, uh, if, ands and buts. L- let me start with one thing that I think really sort of, sort of encapsulates the, the issue going back again to the, uh, to the, uh, report that the utilities did last year uh, on uh, on utility options. They looked at a broad range of options, and it's that report that told us that uh, LNG was a better option than uh, Cook Inlet gas or any of the other alternatives. Uh, going back to that report, that report indeed looked at an in-state pipeline as, as one of the options focused solely on uh, delivering gas to the Cook Inlet. They also had you know, the potential of that pipeline being expanded to export volumes and what that would do in terms of price. But they had one of the options was to look uh, solely at uh, having a pipeline down from the North Slope to deliver gas to, uh, to to the Cook Inlet region, to the Fairbanks and the Cook Inlet region. Their analysis of that option, they split in half. They split one into privately owned pipeline, that is non-subsidized pipeline. What would the what would the delivered price be from that pipeline uh, if it wasn't subsidized? And then a, right. a second one from a, a subsidized or what they call the state-owned uh, option. The price, the delivered price per MCF 
uh, of the privately owned, the non-subsidized option was $28 an MCF. That compares to the current Cook Inlet price of around $9, and it compares to the, the marginal supplies coming from LNG of around $13 um, uh, in, in that report. Um, and so you had a price from the privately owned line, the privately owned uh, delivery system down from the North Slope, of more than double what the LNG option was. They did look at what would happen if you subsidize the line, if you heavily subsidize the line. And that $28 price drops down to $9 um, uh, below uh, the, uh, the, the, imported, the marginal uh, imported LNG price. But that is a heavily subsidized state-owned line. That's what, that's what that option told us. So with that background, $28 for a privately owned line versus $9 in the, in the utilities owned report versus $9. Let's look at the, let's look at what Wood Max said about the, about the LNG line. They're saying that the delivered costs of gas in their base load scenario would be about $12.80, much closer to the heavily subsidized option that uh, that was looked at in last year's utility report versus the privately privately owned line. So that's telling you that there's a lot of subsidies. I think that's telling you that there's a lot of subsidies that are going on in the Woodmac report or in the in the Woodmac proposal. And you and you really and 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 so that tells you what to start looking for, and it tells you to start looking for where those subsidies are. And who's paying those subsidies to try to ferret out what the what the what the real proposal is, what the real cost of the proposal is? There's some and things in the Woodmac. I'm sorry. Okay, I was just going to say that, and that's the big problem here is that there's no there's no idea of where these billions of dollars are going to come from to build this thing, and there's no idea as to you know what the you know again where the overall cost uh, uh, factors are going to lie. Yeah, I think I think that's right, and and part of the problem here is is a credibility issue. I mean, Wood Mac Wood, Wood McKenzie is a great consulting group. I, I I don't I don't question Wood McKenzie at all, but they're they're engaged in this report for a purpose. They're driving toward a purpose, and the purpose is to show that that the that the the price of an LNG option is competitive, or the price of the of the pipeline option down from the North Slope is competitive with imported LNG. And you take that as a starting point and you start and you start going backwards, you reverse engineer from that. And 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 so you start thinking about things, well what have I got to assume to get to that point because that's that's my end point. And that's that's a lot of how this report reads to me. I've read a lot of these reports in my life. That's a lot of how this report reads to me. It's a lot of reverse engineering of what does it take to be competitive with uh with imported LNG. What do I have to assume? Uh, in order to in order to to do that, one of the assumptions, I mean, right off the top of my head, just really struck me, struck me in the face. One of the assumptions is that we have a market uh, of about 188 million cubic feet a day, which is which is about the size of the current utility market in the in the Cook Inlet, and that 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 size market lasts roughly plus or minus. To 2071, through the life of the pipeline. Well, the electric utilities have already told us that they're moving toward hydro, renewables, uh, other alternatives uh, to uh, have uh, supply. Uh, Representative McCabe has pushed coal. I mean, we we've already looked at. We're already seeing the development of a number of alternative supplies for the electric, the power generation market. And, and I think it's a heroic assumption, frankly, to, to say that the size of the market is going to stay the same, the size of the market, which is heavily influenced by the power generation market, the size of the market is going to stay the same, roughly the same, through 2071. But that's one of the things you do when you're trying to drive to a certain price level. You're, that's one of the things you say to yourself when you're trying to drive to a person uh, a price level because the, the per unit price is no more than total cost divided by total volumes. So you keep the volumes up, you keep the divisor up to keep the unit cost down. 
and 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 one of the assumptions that are that underlies the Wood Mac report is they're keeping the the volumes very heavy through 2071 through the through the through the life of the uh, the proposed life of the pipeline. And I just think that's I think that's uh, I, I, that's an assumption, but it's not an assumption that that I think is in the it was was used by the utilities own report uh, last year, and it's not an assumption that off the top of your head uh, you think to be you think to be reasonable. Uh, there are other assumptions in here. There's a big assumption around uh, around the federal guarantee. Um, the slide I sent you, you may let's pop it up if you can. If it's if it's not, I got it's it. Not gonna, it's not going to not going to strain the system. No, it'll 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 be fine. Okay. Um, so there's a lot. There's there's now that's the, that's the first slide. Is do, do you have the slide I sent this morning? There we go. All right. So this is uh, uh, various sensitivities. This slide is in the Wood Mac report and it shows the various sensitivities. Another big assumption around this, around their proposal, is that the federal guarantee kicks in, uh, and the federal guarantee uh, has the effect of reducing the price, uh, reducing the cost, and thus reducing the price significantly. Federal guarantee on an in-state pipeline is not is not a certainty. I mean, it's a potential. the 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 statute it potentially is broad enough to provide a federal guarantee to the in-state line. But it's not it's not a certainty. And 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 this assumes that 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 we lock in on the federal guarantee and the federal guarantee reduces the price, uh, reduces the cost of the project significantly. Another assumption, uh, look at the property tax assumption It's the third from the bottom in this in this list of assumptions. Uh, it assumes that the state and the and the localities that otherwise would collect property tax on the project essentially decide to essentially agree to waive it. It it takes the it takes the base property tax down to down to 0.2% as opposed to the the likely property tax if everybody applied the statutes uh, as they're as they're written at uh, at 2%, uh, 10 times higher. Um, and that has a significant effect on the cost uh, of the pipeline if you assume that Property tax instead of the 0.2% of assessed value is two per, is is a full two percent of assessed value. It increases the cost of the line uh, significantly. So there are a lot of assumptions that are going into uh, this projection that I think are uh, 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 make it less than certain <laughs> that this is the real cost. I think what we ought to do, frankly, is we ought to have the same group, the same group that assessed. The utility, uh, the utility options last year. That's written a report that hasn't been released uh, this year. Do a look at this. Do a third party look at this in the context of all the things that they assumed, including including reductions in in uh, uh, in demand on the power generation side. Take a look at this and sort of give it a reality check and identify where those where those subsidies are, so that we can see clearly. How we're how, who who we're assuming takes the takes the bullet on these things in order to get the cost down. Well, and it's not surprising. Uh, again, the report was commissioned by AGDC, so you wonder where some of those assumptions came from. Uh, I mean, did they give criteria when they said do a study and base it on these assumptions? Is this something that the AGDC thinks they can get through, or you know, uh, whatever else? Sixty seconds here. Well, uh, it's a it's a it, it 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 assumes a lot of good a lot of things go right, and it assumes virtually nothing goes bad, and and these assumptions carry costs to somebody, uh, carry reduced revenues to the state in terms of property taxes, carry reduced revenues to localities, in terms of the property taxes that uh, that they earn, assumes the federal the federal government kicks in with a guarantee, assumes somebody comes up with the with the two and a half billion dollars that that this assumes uh, is provided by equity, assumes you find banks that are that are willing to provide the other seven point five billion dollars, assumes you can bring it home for roughly ten billion dollars in total costs. A lot of assumptions, uh, a lot and a, and a lot of favorable assumptions to the project. So I I think 
I, I don't think we have an answer here. I think what we have is the beginning of more questions about how, uh, about how this would be put together. I mean, Brad, every time I looked at this thing and even the, even the uh, ADN pointed out that, you know, again, there's no, there's no source for any of the funds. There's no dollars for where this is going. I mean, it's a lot of pie in the sky. If you build it, they will come is what it felt like, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, on this. And it, it quite honestly, this feels like a Hail Mary. This feels like this is everything that all the legislators and everybody who's emotionally tied to using Alaska gas, that this is what they've been waiting and hoping for this whole time, right? This is what they were waiting and hoping for this whole time was, this is the report that that will show that we can build our own gas line and use our own gas and it will be cheaper. Um, and I just don't, I, I just, you know, again, the, the metrics have not worked out. The economics have not worked out forever. And I think this just, again, raises more questions than it does answers. I, I think, I think the Hail Mary is a, is a good, is a good analogy here. Uh, Michael, I, recall that this legis the last legislature put AGDC at uh, force AGDC into position where AGDC essentially said, we will have something put together by the end of the year, or we will start wrapping up this project. We won't, we won't, to take any more money. We won't spend any more money. We'll just start wrapping up the project. And, and they haven't, AGDC hasn't brought home, the AKLNG project hasn't brought home uh, uh, international markets that would underwrite, you know, enter into contracts that would underwrite, underwrite the project. They've tried hard. Gosh, I don't know anybody would have tried harder than they have, but they've not brought those international projects home. And so they're facing an end of year, a self-imposed end of year deadline. Um, and, and, you know, they haven't brought home the international project. So I think it is a Hail Mary in the sense of, Hey, maybe we can sell this in-state option because everybody wants, you know, there's seeming, a, seemingly a lot of emotion around getting in-state gas to solve the, solve the South Central crisis. So maybe we can land this, but, you know, we've got to land it. We got to land it at a price that's competitive with, with imported LNG. And so I can, I've done this myself in, in various projects. I can see how this goes. Right. We've got to get a price of X. And so you reverse engineer all the assumptions you need to get that price of X. Well, problem is the assumptions are not very realistic. I mean, I, I seldom I seldom very agree uh, agree with Larry personally, but at the end of the ADN article, they quoted Larry personally uh, and said, uh, 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 said the report is based on several of the most optimistic assumptions falling into place said key questions include whether the current cost estimates too low, who will invest the billions of dollars to build the project. He said it's worrisome to base an $11 billion decision if in fact it is $11 billion on everything going right. There's a lot, lot of cards in this house that could turn up the wrong way as you try to build this thing. And it's just, I mean, it, the, the assumptions, the favorable assumptions go way beyond you know, being able to raise $11 million and who's going to come up with the $2.5 billion in equity. Is based on a lot of other assumptions about you know the market staying essentially as it is through 2072. One thing this thing does do that that LNG doesn't is it closes out the Cook Inlet. If you build this line and you make all this investment in bringing gas down from the from the from the North Slope, since it's so contingent on all the volumes going to North Slope gas, you you've closed out the Cook Inlet. There will be no incentive for exploration in the Cook Inlet. Because even if you find something in the Cook Inlet, you're not going to you're not going to be able to back out the pipeline. The cost of backing out the pipeline, uh, the tumble the, the the tumbling effect of backing out the pipeline would be too great. So it it does close this option does close out the LNG for for does close out the Cook Inlet for those who say, oh, we need to keep an opening for the Cook Inlet. This closes it. It's done. It's over. LNG, on the other hand, imported LNG does still create an opportunity for additional supplies from the Cook Inlet. So it's, 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 it, 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 there's a lot of heroic assumptions in there and it has a lot of consequences that I'm not sure we've thought through. Welcome back to the program. We're continuing on now. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're on to number two of the weekly top three. And this time it's the uh, government is the economy Republicans who seem to be circling the wagons, Brad. Uh, what's uh, what's happening with this? All right. So there was an op-ed piece in uh, in the ADN 
uh, in support of Kelly Merrick. It was signed by Anna McKinnon, who many may remember as former Senator Anna Fairclaw from uh, from Eagle River, uh, and Ann Brown, former chairman of the Republican Party. And the argument basically is that Kelly Merrick, along with Bert Stedman, they explicitly identify the name Bert Stedman. So maybe this is an opportunity for South Central people to vote against Bert by voting against Kelly. Um, it, they identify uh, that, uh, that Kelly and Bert and the Senate Finance Committee and the legislature as a whole, with Kelly's participation, has delivered real prosperity for Alaskans. Well, that's just a bunch of hooey. Uh, here's, here's the core of the argument. Not too long ago, the state was running multi-billion dollar deficits, draining the constitutional budget, budget and statutory budget reserve. Today, Alaska's budget is balanced. It's a shocker, given the uh, given the amount of tax on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFDs. Today, Alaska's budget is balanced, and rather than deficit spending, the legislature has put billions of dollars into Alaska savings accounts. They've diverted the PFD, a portion of the PFD, back into the savings account to make it look like they're building back up uh, the state's uh, savings accounts. The credit for for delivering such fiscal stability goes to the real fiscal conservatives in the legislature on the Senate Finance Committee. This includes Kelly Merrick's work with Senator Bert Stedman. Balancing the budget means saying no over to over and over to requests for more spending. There aren't many elected officials who have the resolve to balance the budget and maintain the kind of fiscal discipline necessary to create a pro-business climate leading to real prosperity for Alaska. Senator Merrick has maintained fiscal discipline, and as a result, our state is seeing more North Slope development, more oil entering the pipeline over the next day, and significant job growth across resource development industries. What they're essentially saying is, look, PFD cuts, don't worry about those. Yes, we've done those to balance the budget, but we don't count those as, as, as you know, taxes or anything like that. We just count those as, as a way of balancing the budget. We balance the budget and, uh, and we've delivered prosperity. What they've delivered prosperity for is the top 20% non-resident industries uh, and the oil companies who otherwise would be paying additional taxes in order to cover a portion of the additional spending that's built up since that's built up since 2013, the last time we set the last time we set oil taxes. That's who they delivered prosperity to. The other 80% of Alaskas uh, of Alaska families, those in the middle, those six that 60% in the middle income brackets and the 20% in the low income bracket, those families have suffered losses in terms of taking more money out of their pockets than alternative revenue measures would. So the prosperity that Anna McKinnon and Anna Fairclaw, Ann Brown and Kelly Merrick are celebrating is the prosperity they've delivered for their donors and for their, and for their industry friends in terms of in terms of preventing them or protecting them from having to pay any of the costs of increased government by shifting those costs to middle and lower income Alaska families. It, the, budget, the budget is far from balanced. If you look at who the burden has been put on to, to, to so-called balance this budget, to so-called make the left side add up to the right side, to the right side add up to, add up to the left side, if you look at who the burden been, has been put on, it's put, been put on hugely disproportionately to the 60% of Alaska families lying in the middle income classes and the 20% lying in the, falling in the, in the low income bracket. The top 20% non-residents and, and the oil companies have escaped. So the prosperity they're talking about is prosperity for them and their friends. It's not prosperity for Alaska as a whole. It's not prosperity for Alaskans who take their PFD and, and enable themselves to afford college. It's not a prosperity for Alaskans that take their PFD and invest it in small businesses that enable them to, to take care of themselves. It's not prosperity for the thousands of Alaskans that have been shoved below the poverty line as a result of, as a result of reductions in the PFD. It's, it's prosperity only for those who have been able to shield themselves from the burdens of increased spending by pushing the costs down to the remaining 80% of Alaska families. And those who've been able to shield themselves are those in the top 20%, non-resident industries 
and the oil companies. I mean, this is part of the, <laughs> this is it, it. Of course, all you have to do is look at the players. And when I saw Ann Brown's name associated with this, I was like, oh, okay, I see. It's the, it's that kind of Republican. And as you point out, it's the government economy kind of Republicans that are circling the wagon here. They want to beat their chest and tell us all that it's balanced and that it's all good and that they knew better than you how to spend that money. Uh, and that's what this again goes back to this trust issue of do they trust the people to do the right thing? And I think the answer to that is obviously no, they don't. They believe that they, again, know better than us how to spend that money and that we should just shut up and sit down and be grateful that we've got some brilliant minds in there that are out there uh, spending the money and balancing things out and making it all work for us, right? Yep. It's, it's prosperity. For, it, it is. It's prosperity for those tied to the government. It's prosperity for those who have benefited from increased government spending. It's the prosperity for those who would, who would benefit from additional increased government spending over the next decade uh, as the as the PFD is 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 continually bled in order to support uh, increased spending. That's the prosperity they're talking about. And that's the prosperity in this state that largely goes to the top 20 percent non-resident industries and to and to the oil companies. The rest of the 80 percent, the other 80 percent of Alaska families, the ones that are pushed below the poverty lines, the ones that don't have the money to go to college now, the ones that don't uh, have the money to, to start their small bop, pop and small mom and pop operations. Forget about them. That's that's not that's not who we're who who we think of when we think of prosperity. We just think of legislators just think of them and their friends. Uh, and them and their and their donors. That's who needs to have prosperity in the way they've achieved prosperity is by taking the money for this increased government spending out of the pockets of the remaining 80% of Alaska families. Right. And, and of course, again, this is, uh, this is indicative of every legislature that we've seen since we received that first big revenue check from the oil companies. And this is, quite honestly, this is why Hammond came up with, Hammond and company came up with the permanent fund dividend was because they saw what happened. They burned through almost a billion dollars at a time when the state budget was only $162 million for the entire year. And they burned through a billion dollars in like a single session. And Hammond was like, whoa, 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 maybe we should see some of this money actually get into the private economy. This is what he was concerned about. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And you know Anna Fairclaw, you, you can go down the line. Anna Fairclaw was part of the part of the early twenty teens uh, spendicans uh, that were in the legislature that just kept spending. I mean, Sean Parnell led, uh, but uh, the people who just kept spending and spending and spending and saying, "Oh, don't worry about it. We got the we got the statutory budget reserve until that wasn't anymore. Until they ran out of the money there. Now we have got the constitutional budget reserve, and they just kept spending." And that was that was Anna's. That was you know Anna was co chair of finance at various times. Uh, in uh, in those efforts, it's 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 gratifying, I guess, in a way, to see that I that the that they that they tie themselves to Bert. I mean, because because that makes clear where the where the leadership on this on this effort has been to 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 take out uh, take money from middle and lower income Alaska families in order to you know subsidize the top twenty percent on residents and, and oil companies. It's been Burt and company of which Kelly is a, is a big part of which Anna was a big part when she was in the legislature, uh, that have done that. And, you know, and for them to claim it's balanced and for them to claim all oh, the budgets balanced, don't worry about it. You know, we push back on spending. No, you haven't. What you push back on is, 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 is upholding the statute, complying with the statute to distribute PFDs to, uh, uh, to to Alaska residents. That's what you've said no to. You haven't said no to spending. You've continued to spend. And the reason that you've cut the PFD is because you needed funds to continue to spend and wanted to shield yourself from being from being part of that. So that's, you know, that's, that's <laughs> We'll talk about this more in the next segment, but that's part of the Orwellianization of Alaska political language. To call that balance, to call taking money out of the pockets of 80% of Alaska families in order to subsidize and fund the other 20% the toys that 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 the other 20% want, the toys that the oil industry wants, the toils, to, toys to protect the, the government to protect the government spend essentially, right? Yep. To spend this money to protect the government spend at the cost of everything else, thumbs up. That's what they're looking for, right? That's the whole thing. They're they're 100% thumbs up behind that. That's their definition of balance. Right. Just to, 
is to, is to drain money out of the pockets of the other 80 percent in order to in order to fund government brad i you know th this whole thing just is so irritating to read and to watch it's the hoity-toityness of and i think donna actually says it right here donna says one could only write a piece like that if they thought you were all stupid and that's exactly it, right? I mean, that's exactly how it seems to be. They, they just act like, again, oh, you poor, poor, pitiful children. Just shut up and sit down while the adults talk in the room. That seems yeah. to be the answer. Yeah, you would write that if you thought the government's entitled to everything. I mean, the government's entitled to all of the, all of the revenue, all of the permanent fund earnings that flow through its fingers. It's entitled to all of that. It's entitled to, to build industries, to build uh, uh to spend money in a way that benefits, you know, a certain segment of the economy. It, if you, if you thought the government was entitled to do that, that that was government's purpose to build industry, to build, uh, uh, you know, to, to subsidize activities that they think is important. Then you'd write, you write an art, you'd write an article like that. You wouldn't be a Republican <laughs> and, and write an article like that. This is more, this is more an article that you would write if you believed in industrial policy and the government ought to drive industrial policy and government ought to spend it in a certain way in order to drive to drive certain results, as opposed to letting the free market, as opposed to letting individuals make the choice about how uh, about how the economy develops. This is this is an article you would write then. But that's I mean, that's an article you typically see from Democrats. And indeed, you see from far left Democrats. Uh, who believe that government is the is the be all and end all, and government is entitled to all of the all of the money it needs in order to to be the be all and end all? Kyle says, "I I don't I think he he may be missing part of the point here." She says, "The pre PFD billion spent certainly made it to the private sector. Um, I mean, it trickles through the government to get to the private sector, and it's not necessary. It's about the government spend, right? And we know how many times." money that's in government hands versus money that's in private hands. It goes directly into, we know how many times it turns in the economy. I mean, Donna's in here. She can sound off on this. I know it's just, it's around one time in government hands and it's between six and seven times in private hands. So yeah, I mean, eventually all that money trickles down, but we're talking about, we're talking about putting the money directly into the hands of the citizens instead of taking it and having government be the nanny state to tell us how to spend it. Right, Brad? Well, it's, the, it's government directed. I mean, it's so it's yes, it made it made it hand its hands into the private the portions of the private economy that government favors. I mean, the, you, you talk about you know talk about Hammond's purpose. Hammond's purpose was to take a portion of that and to allow the people to decide essentially how to how to spend, allow them to to make the decision about what was important to their lives, to invest in to invest in college savings, to invest in small businesses, allow them to make. Uh, to make that decision. It, it, yes, you know, by putting it in government's hands, yes, it's going to the private sector, but it's going to the portions of the private sector, you know, the, the, the construction contractors and everybody else that government decides is important as opposed to the private sector deciding what's important. So it's, you, you can argue, you, you actually can argue that that's not part of the private sector. The government related part of the private sector that this money is going to is just really part of government. It's an extended part of government as opposed to, as opposed to an extended part of the private sector. As opposed you mean to, to the contractors and to the companies that are basically, you know, taking the government contracts and, and slurping off the government teat essentially. Yeah. The consultants and, 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 and all that sort of stuff, you know, it, K through 12 is part of the government sector. It's, it, it is, it is distributing the, distributing the money in a way that is that you know is 21 21 plus 11 plus 1 decide we're not letting the economy as a whole we're not letting alaskans decide where to distribute the money we're letting 21 plus 11 plus 1 uh, decide and that's that's problematic that's central planning that's that's things that you would think you would see coming from far left democrats as opposed to coming from the former chairman the immediate past chairman of the alaska republican party and and from from a senator who during her time in the legislature at least you know had an R behind her name if not if not behind her her philosophy so it's I mean we're 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 seeing the prioritization of the government and the defense of the prioritization of the government and when you use the word prosperity 
It is the prosperity for those tied to the government and or those shielded from having to pay a portion of the costs uh, that government spending shielded by pushing the burden down to middle and lower income Alaska families as opposed to having to contribute themselves. Uh, let's finish up with a weekly top three. And this is where the leftover dividend now becomes the surplus dividend. This plays into what you were talking about, the Orwellian doublespeak of balanced budgets. Now it becomes the surplus dividend. Yeah, there was an article that James Brooks did on the Fairbanks race between Scott Kawasaki and I'm going to try, Michael, and you correct me, Leslie Hajukovic? Hajukovic? Hajukovic. Hajukovic. Hi. I need to get the high in there. All right. Yeah. So... Um, I was, I was pretty good on the rest of it. It's just, I was missing the beginning. You did great. You did great. <laughs> um, so, uh, James Brooks did an article on, on this race and it's, uh, the article is sort of what you would expect except for this passage. Uh, and he's describing the differences between Kawasaki and Hajdukovic on oil taxes and budgeting. Um, and he says Hajdukovic opposes, well, during during here's the here's the preceding paragraph. During his time in the legislature, Kawasaki has supported the concept of raising the state's oil taxes in order to pay for a larger permanent fund dividend and improve state services. Hydukovich appro- opposes that approach, she said by phone. Her preference, as outlined in a written answer, is to pay a dividend using what's left over in the state budget after services are covered. In other words, the Natasha. Uh, the Natasha von Imhoff uh, approach of the leftover budget approach. Here's the next paragraph, though, that just stunned me. That surplus dividend, this is this is Brooks writing, that surplus dividend, as it has been labeled, is the approach that state lawmakers have generally followed since 2016. I have never heard the leftover dividend approach referred to as the surplus dividend. We've talked on the show about the surpluses that some legislators are claiming they're creating by budgeting, which is, and and that surplus is to take more from the PFD than they need in order to cover spending, in order to create this contingency fund out there to really pre-fund next year's uh, supplemental spending. That's the surplus that we've heard about before, the surplus, this, 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 this additional contingency that they've that they've taken from the PFD to put into uh, to put into a, a pot for uh, for advance for the supplemental spending. We I've never heard the dividend the way they've calculated the dividend is the leftover dividend. I've never heard that referred to as the surplus dividend. And 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 Brooks may be trying to create uh, a his own Orwellianization of the Alaska political language by now calling it. Um, the surplus uh, dividend that that conjures up all sorts of things. Oh, aren't we lucky that we have this surplus? Aren't we lucky that? I mean, it, it, it's intended. It's intended to use language to create the impression that the dividend is just you know a happenstance as opposed to something that's set that's set by statute. This goes back also to some what some sometimes claim. About, about the nature of the dividend. Some say, some analogi- analogize it to co- a common stock dividend. And in a corporation, a common stock dividend really is sort of a leftover dividend. It really is, did we have enough earnings after we pay all of our costs and pay debt and everything else and pay and, and fund our capital budget, do we have enough leftover to, to, to pay to common stockholders, to provide a return to common, common stockholders? And that's really although you do it over a much longer time frame, but that's really sort of how you calculate a common stock dividend. But that's not what the PFD is. There's another dividend, another corporate dividend called a preferred dividend. And a preferred dividend is set by rules that that are that are announced at the time that shareholders buy preferred dividends or buy preferred stock. Um, and, and the dividend on that preferred stock is set by rule. If the company has an explosive year and earns a huge amount of money, the preferred dividend doesn't get any more. If the company has a horrible trash year, doesn't have any money, has to go to the bank and borrow, the preferred dividend still gets 
what's provided by those rules because that was the deal at the time the company sold the preferred stock. It's a lot like debt. Preferred dividends are a lot like debt in that they're set by rule and they're set by amount. They're a little bit different from debt because they have a lower ranking in the event of bankruptcy, but other than, and, and so they have a slightly higher return than debt does, but, but that's what preferred dividends are. And that's the way Alaska set up the PFD by creating rules, creating statutes that set the preferred dividend uh, set the dividend at a at a at a set amount at a, at amount by rule. If the if the state has a blowout year, it doesn't get any more. If the state has a, a horrible year, it doesn't get any less. That's the nature of the PFD. And and this concept of surplus dividend that Brooks is creating here is a concept that that tries to pick up on the common stock analogy and says, oh well, if we have a surplus at the end of the year after we've covered everything else. If we have a surplus at the end of the year, you get the benefit of that. That's a common stock analogy. And yes, you might call that a surplus dividend, but that's not what the PFD is. And, and now we've got, we got Brooks just completely ignoring the statute, completely ignoring that it exists, that there's never been a majority to change it, that, that you have certain legislators who say, well, we're just not gonna pay attention to it anymore. And on a year-to-year -year basis in the appropriations process, don't pay attention to it, but they've never changed the long-term statute. They've never changed the rules underlying uh, the permanent fund dividend. And for Brooks and others to now refer to it to a as a surplus dividend I, is just Orwellianization. It's just an attempt to create right. new speak, to create new concepts behind something that, that just isn't right, just isn't what that PFD is. Right. I mean, I heard the I heard the surplus dividend here probably just a couple months ago. It was probably the first time that I had heard it. Uh, but I had to laugh because again, that folded right back into their whole commentary about, oh, we're 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 balancing the budget. We're about ba yeah, you're balancing the budget on the backs of Alaskans. You're all balancing the budget on, you know, either draws from the CBR, the SBR, or drawing down the PFD. One of the one of the three. Is that truly about if you are living uh, if you're if you're a household and you've got you know fifty thousand dollars in savings and you're overspending every month and having to draw a thousand dollars a month out of savings, is that truly a balanced budget? If you're drawing from your kid's college fund every month, is that truly a balanced budget? That's I mean that's kind of where we're at right now. We're balancing it. We're just balancing it from a finite pool of resources that's going to go away eventually. And then what will you do? Well, we're bouncing it from a finite pool of resources and we're taking it from somebody else. I mean, the, C, the, the CBR, not so much the SBR, but the CBR is intended as a fund, a, 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 a borrowing fund, a lending fund that's available across all generations. That's why you have to pay it back because it's intended to be there for all generations, future generations, when they get into financial problems. You, you're there, the intention is that they are able to draw on the CBR. But, you know, but but we, we we we're taking it now. We're taking it for the current generation. We're not paying it back. So we're robbing it from future generations. The PFD is intended to be there for all Alaska families and intent and, and important for for big segments of Alaska families, 80 percent of Alaska families. But now we're just we're just we're just taking from them. We're taxing them in order to in order to shield the top 20 percent and the non-residents. 60 percent. 60 second wrap up here, Brad, for all that we've talked about today. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I think, I think all of it is you can't trust language anymore. Maybe, maybe that's it. You can't trust the, the AKLNG when they said, oh, we've got a plan because, because it's going to be competitive. Well, you have to look behind the word competitive. You can't trust uh, James Brooks when he says surplus dividend because, because it's not that it's a, it's a preferred dividend with, with, with rules that that need to be followed and you're ignoring the rules if you if you have a dividend that's uh that's that's other than that and in terms of in terms of anna mckinnon and uh, ann brown you can't trust their words when they say we have a balanced budget or you can't trust their words when we when they say that uh we are pro prosperity it's prosperity for a few and it's a balanced budget on the backs of 80 percent of alaska families words matter and and they're distorting the language words yeah, and again, this this just shows and highlights again the differences between two types of people 
that we have out there right now. It's not Democrats and Republicans. It's the pro-government economy over everything else versus protecting the private economy and balance, having a connectivity between the two. And we seem to have completely lost that at this point. That's the biggest part of the problem. Yep, yep. Government prosperity over Alaskans' prosperity. Kyle says, do the words of the Constitution matter? The the rules are in the Constitution. What, I mean, I don't know exactly what he's referring to there. Other than they have the appropriation power to do whatever the hell they want. Is that essentially what he's saying? Yeah, on on a year-to-year basis, sure. But on a statutory basis, we've, I mean, the words of the Constitution do matter. The legislature has the power to adopt statutes. The statutes do matter. I mean, they matter for the rest of us. They ought to matter for the legislature. Uh, and the statutes provide certain certain uh, guides, certain uh, uh, obligations that the legislature that the legislature has. Yes, they can override it on an annual on a on a on an annual basis. The Supreme Court said that clearly. Yep, big deal. But if but if they want to override it and they want to set new rules, if they want to set a fiscal policy, a durable fiscal policy, they need to change the statute, and they haven't done it. Because right now they've got competing statutes. That's the biggest uh, That's the biggest they problem don't, here. No, they don't have competing statutes. They don't have competing statutes. The, 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 the POMV statutes, statute does not compete with the, no, with, the, no. uh, with, with the draw? No? No, we've talked about this on the show before. The POMV statute sets a, a, a big dollar amount uh, uh, that can be drawn from the P, from the from the permanent fund earning from the permanent fund. Within that big dollar amount, the statute clearly provides that a portion of it is for the PFD, and the and the remaining portion. This is what the statute provides. The remaining portion is is for government. It didn't. It that that statute does not overwrite the PFD statute. They left the PFD statute in place for that very purpose to to convey the the image to people that they were leaving the PFD statute in place. The two work absolutely, absolutely well together. There is no conflict between them. Bert Stedman says there is because Bert wants to then say, well, there's a conflict, so we got to decide. There isn't right, a conflict. Right, right. Because basically one draws the money, what the other one pays it out is what you're saying. Right. right? One, one sets the amount of the draw and how much money comes in, and the other one is the, is the disbursement of a portion of that money. And those two statutes, they're, they're both in the same... They're right next door to each other in two in two statutes, uh, and they and they absolutely work well together. If the legislature thought there was a conflict in them, it could have resolved it at the time it passed the POMB statute. But it right. left the PFD statute in place and and built the POMB statute around them. All right. Well, uh, Brad, uh, this this whole thing. Do I, I, I just, you know, this is what this is what kills me is that again, this is not about parties anymore. This is about philosophies. This is about how people are different in what they believe is the most important. Is the private economy the most important driver in a state, or is the public government economy the most important driver in the state? And we've got a bunch of people out there that believe the government one is the most important one because we're so disconnected from what happens in the private sector. Uh, compared to other states where they have to draw their revenues from the uh, from the private sector to exist. And we've got that difference and it's just, it's so frustrating to watch. Final thoughts here. Well, final thoughts are we need, we need to watch the words. And when somebody says it's a surplus dividend, that is not what the statutes provide. That is not what the the legislature's statutory guidance says it is. It's something that people are making up to try to back in justify taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. And and words matter. And we need to understand the concepts as they're written, as opposed to what people are trying to make them up into. All right. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. Brad, thanks for... uh... Thanks for coming on and joining us. Um, I think it, uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully people are starting to understand a little bit deeper. And if not, I guess we'll do another 10 years of this, you and me. (laughs) I just, just, this month is 10 years. You realize that this month is 10 years that we've been doing this, uh, this little chit chat. 
That's a that's a long time, Michael. We ought to have a throw a party or something. We we ought to throw a party. We ought to throw a party. As long as you're paying, I'm good. All right. <laughs> uh Brad Keithley. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.